Welcome everyone, and you can be seated for a few moments. Let me extend my welcome to the stage party behind me, members of our Joint Board of Overseers, the deans, vice presidents, and leadership of Hofstra University and the leadership of our health system, the two partners that have created this medical school, to board members, trustees, people in the VIP seating section, many, many faculty, I thank you for being here, continuing to support this school every day. Uh, and one, one, one special welcome, and that is to my wife of 45 years, whose birthday is today. I don't know how she put up with me. <laughs> in addition, I want to point out the people who led the procession in. The Grand Marshal was Dr. David Elkowitz, and he is the leader of the Academy of Medical Educators, and all the people wearing this medal who walked in the faculty are members of the Academy. The Faculty Marshal was Dr. John Pellerito, who is the President of the Faculty Council. And then we had two graduate marshals who were literally chosen by the class because they are the winners of the Teacher of the Year for the first 100 weeks and the second 100 weeks. And that was Dr. Jill Raven from the Department of OBGYN and Dr. Joe Wiener, who leads our communications program. Both of them have been honored by the students and were leaders in, in marching the procession in. So congratulations to them. So, so we, before we move on with the program, which will happen momentarily, I'd like to orient you. So I mentioned the Academy of Medical Educators. Those students wearing blue ribbons are graduating with distinction in research. Those with gold cords are members of the Gold Humanism Honor Society. That is an honor society where the peer group of co-students elect the people that they basically vote for as being the people they would like to see as doctors in the future and their family members. A high honor to be nominated and elected by your peers. And those wearing blue and gold are Alpha Omega Alpha, the National Honor Society for Medical School, similar to Phi Beta Kappa in the undergraduate. So those are the things that people are wearing that are, are unique on their academic garb. I also thought that I would walk you through the program. Uh, in the beginning, you see the Gospelons behind me and the explanation for their historical meaning in front of you. Uh, and then the, the, present, the schedule of the presentations. And then the list of the names of the students. And we have two students who are receiving a PhD in biomolecular research and 72 students who will be receiving their MD degree. There are the awards that we get, were given out earlier today. And then you'll see members of the Alpha Omega Alpha Society, the Gold Humanism Society, the Distinction in Research, the names of our key faculty members, board members, deans, chairs, the members of the, of the Academy of Medical Educators, and then finally, a cute picture of this class when they first arrived, when they looked 20 years younger. Uh, the, the match results for this class, and then the three different oaths that you will hear administered during this ceremony. So with that, I'd like to ask Rabbi Dave Siegel to come up with the invocation. Please stand. Creator of life, as we gather here today to celebrate the achievements of these amazing graduates, we give thanks for bringing them safely to this joyous occasion. Thank you for providing them with the strength, wisdom, and endurance to become the agents of change that we desperately need in this world. We know that this achievement was not accomplished alone. Thank you for the love, support, and guidance of their families, friends, teachers, and administrators. As they leave this school and head to the next stage of their journey, Please continue to watch over them and remind them that they are never alone. Allow them the insight to recognize the miracles that they witness every day and during the difficult times the ability to continue their holy work. There's a well-known teaching from the Talmud that states, whoever saves a life is as if they have saved an entire world. Each night as we gaze upon the heavens, may we be reminded of the numerous lives that you have touched and the important role that you play in this universe. Thank you. 
And now I'd like to call Andrew Leyland up. Andrew is a, one of our alumni, and he will be leading us in the national anthem. Smith, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty administration, distinguished guests of both the university and the health system, but far most importantly, our graduates and their proud family and friends, it's my honor to welcome you to the commencement ceremony for the third graduating class of Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. Now, Dean Smith, of course, prepared the program. And if you notice, he has Michael Dowling and I giving greetings, not speeches or remarks or commentary. That's Larry's way of saying, you both talk forever usually, but not today. <laughs> so I won't. But we do gather here this afternoon to celebrate the accomplishments and the incredible hard work of you, our remarkable graduates and to honor the sacrifices that have been made on your behalf by your family and by your friends. Today surely must mark the realization of the dreams of our students, but it also, once again, for the third time, marks the realization of the dreams, the big dreams, of the university and the health system. About a decade ago, many of us on this stage both at Hofstra and Northwell, came together in the belief that we could create a successful medical school on Long Island, and that in fact a new medical school was a necessity for our institutions, for our region, and yes, for the future of healthcare. It was a big dream, and actually, when we told most people, to put it bluntly, they thought we had lost our minds. But we were not deterred. We all believed that our two institutions could partner and create something new and different and meaningful that might change how medicine was taught in this nation. And the missing ingredient that we all were worried about were that we needed great students to heed our call. And you are great students, and you did. We needed remarkable students who were willing to take a risk on a dramatically new curriculum 
And who could imagine a future for healthcare very different from what we have today? You are all that we had hoped for and more. You believed in yourselves and your ability. You wanted to be physicians so that you could make the world a better place. And you believed in this school. You believed that this medical school could not just educate you about medical facts, but could prepare you for a life's work of healing, of service, and of fulfillment. The fact that every member of all three of our graduating classes have matched residencies with some of the most renowned and prominent hospitals and health systems in the nation prove that you have fulfilled your dream and our dream for you. We have every confidence that the members of the class of 2017 will be great physicians. So I will close my brief greetings, Dean Smith, <laughs> as I have to every graduating class of this university for the past 16 years as president. And that is by simply wishing each and every one of our graduates well. I wish you all the success you think you need and all that your talent and your hard work earn for you. I wish you the perspective to forgive yourself and learn from the inevitable mistakes. And as the father of a physician who at this very moment is someplace in Bolivia um, performing procedures on children, two children getting liver transplant, I especially wish that you find the time in your busy professional life for the love of family and friends. I think the point for me was best made by Dr. Gawande when he told the 2004 graduating class at the Yale Medical School, quote, the life of a doctor is an intense life. You will be witnesses to individual human survival, and you will be servants to individual human survival. The difficulty is that you are also only human being yourselves. You cannot live all of your life just for your patients. In the end, you must also live your own lives. The School of Medicine class of 2017 lives, lives, uh, leaves here with our admiration and affection. Please maintain your ties to your classmates and to your alma mater. From this day forward, your accomplishments will always be the most important driver of the value of our reputation. The university and the health system will always welcome you home. On behalf of the faculty, administration, staff of the School of Medicine, I extend to each of you our heartiest congratulations and our warmest wishes for success and happiness. Thank you. And now it's my privilege to introduce Michael Dowling, the President and CEO of Northwell Health. But more importantly, this year, he trumped that title, the Grand Marshal of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City, Michael Dowling. Thank you, Larry. I think we should make this an Irish event. Okay. Uh, but everybody is sitting down too calmly for that. So, uh, but um, just very, very, very briefly, uh, on behalf of everybody at Northwell and all of the facilities and the faculty and the staff and all of the places that you've been uh, over the last uh, couple of years, as well as all of the staff and the faculty at, uh, at Hartford University, I too congratulate you. And this day, as you know only too well, is one as a, is a special circumstance. It's a special occasion. I would assume that today, as you're sitting there, that this moment will be etched in your memory for a long time. Other occasions like this may fade. Other things that you may be involved in may fade over time. But my guess is that today, it is such a special day that you will always remember it. And if you look around, as has been said already, if you look around at 
all of the smiling faces, the beaming smiles, our family, friends, brothers, sisters, kids, faculty members who share this wonderful occasion with you, they are all part of the cast that created the possibility of you being able to sit here today and experience this wonderful occasion. And today, you enter a life of wonderful opportunity. But you also enter a life of major obligation and responsibility. You're in a special place. You hold a special role. You are physicians. But you're more. You are healers, you are coaches and mentors, you are confidence, you are influencers, and if you take it seriously as I believe you will, you will be change agents. The era of healthcare, the field of healthcare, needs continuous change more than ever before. Change, however, that is realistic, practical, and humane. You can bring that humanity to the delivery of care. You can bring that humanity to development of policy. So as you look at your roles in the future and you anticipate what you might be doing 10 years from now, think of yourselves as a doctor, treating patients, but think of yourself as a leader changing how we do it, where we do it, and how we do it. The degree is a passport to a life of potential extraordinary accomplishment, but only if you grab it, which I know, given the education you've had, and the influence of the faculty on you, I know you will. So feel proud. Thank your families. For the families, I know you're unbelievably appreciative and proud of your offspring today. You're sitting here today because of the collective effort of everybody. So congratulations. We look forward to your futures. Thank you. And thank you, Michael. It is now my privilege to introduce our graduation speaker, Dr. Howard Dean. Howard Dean is a friend of Hofstra University, a physician who graduated from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and then did his residency training at the University of Vermont but quickly became a physician in public service, both service to the country as well as elected office. He was the 79th governor of Vermont and the chair of the Democratic National Committee. And he comes here today at a very timely moment as we re-debate how we will deliver health care in this country. Howard? Thank you uh, very much for your kind introduction, and thank you all, and congratulations. Um, I just want to make a few observations for you to think about, because you are not going to have a lot of time to do any thinking whatsoever in the next three years. I can remember my uh, house officership uh, very well, and thinking was not something other than medical thinking that we had the luxury of doing. So let me just make a couple of observations. First of all, you're too young to know this, but you have already been part of more change than you can possibly imagine in the field of medical education. Hofstra is a, a unique school, and it's a school that has a completely, has revolutionized, I think, the curriculum of medical education in this country. You have experienced a different curriculum. I, I, I don't mean to, mean to embarrass Liz, but I have breakfast with her once a year, and I, the first time I had breakfast with her was in October, of her freshman year, or first year of medical school, and I said, oh, well, what do you, it was very early in the morning, because she had to go to class. 
And I said, well, what are you doing today? She said, oh, I'm going to the operating room with a neurosurgeon. I said, what? Because the curriculum has re been redesigned so you know what the end product is and what's it expect what it's expected to be in your first year here. That's an extraordinary thing. It is part of the vast, enormous change you're already part of. The training that goes on here at Hofstra is now being copied by some of the major universities in the country and will be copied again. So sometimes you're in the middle of change and you don't know it. This is one of those times. So think a lot in the next month about some of the other things that I'm going to talk to you about because it's the last time you're going to have time to think about yourself for a very long time. I want to talk about the value of this training that you've had, and I'll do it by story. Um, people used to ask me all the time, well, did your physician's training have anything to do with your politics, and how did, ha how did it help if it helped? And it helped in two ways and hurt in one. So the first thing is that facts matter. That was an enormously important thing to remember in politics, which is in short supply in Washington. It has been for some time. People don't care what the facts are. They want to make their argument. They don't care if the argument, uh, if the argument is supported by the facts. We were talking earlier before we came in here about two conservatives that I happen to like a lot. And the reason I like them is not because I agree with them, it's because they don't make stuff up. And we can have an argument and try to get to a place where we can get a reasonable solution as long as we can agree on what the facts are. And of all the training that's important uh, in, tr in interaction, particularly with other human beings, you have gotten in some ways the best. And I don't want to say anything disparaging about law school, and especially in front of the president of the university, who was the dean of the law school before he was president of the university. But lawyers are actually trained to give two separate narratives, which may not encompass the same facts or may. Doctors aren't trained to do that. You are trained to look at the facts as best you know them. Now, the facts will change. One of the most fun things I had in medicine uh, in medical school was to look back at cases that began because of apocryphal stories in one case and then suddenly mushroomed into this doctrine. Uh, and you can go back and trace that in the research uh, and, and seeing cases cited which turn out not to have been so factual. So even we in the medical position are not immune to mutating facts, but you are trained to look at the facts. Secondly, the facts matter, so does time. In politics, the main technique to avoid making any kind of a difficult decision is to put it off till a later time. That's what they like to do. That's why things don't happen. You don't have that luxury in medicine. The time runs out for your patient if you can't make a decision, and you are trained, and you will be trained in the next few years, to make decisions not based on all the evidence, because if you wait till all the evidence is in, the patient dies. That was an incredibly valuable thing for me to know in politics and to push people to make the decision and move on. The last piece that wasn't so helpful was that you are going to discover, and you probably maybe have a glimpse of this, one of the things I want you to think about. The amount of power that give you. Doctors do not suffer fools gladly, except possibly pediatricians, which is very nice, and they're the nicest doctors because their patients many oftentimes can't talk back. <laughs> but doctors do not, we're very smart and we've worked very hard and we care what the facts are and not everybody has the luxury of the training that we've had. I tended to be impatient with people. I didn't realize till long after I was in politics that you have to suffer fools gladly in politics because you have to, every one of your constituencies matters whether there's a Nobel Prize winner or or they're not so smart, and they all have one vote, and you have to do that. The power that people are going to give you is unbelievable. It's unbelievable what people will trust you with. There is only one other profession in the entire world where you can meet somebody, and five minutes later, they have no clothes on. Uh, now, I use that line because it gets everybody's attention, but it's true. Think of the power that people are giving you because of your title. It's not because you're a lovely human being or you have a great way about them. It's because they are emotionally concerned and worried about themselves or their kids, and they are giving you the power to heal them. It is an awesome responsibility. It is easy to have that go to your head. Do not let that happen. Do not let that power go to your head. It's not your power. It's their power that they are giving you to use to heal them. And it is incredibly easy to be seduced by this notion in the next three years or four years of your training 
because people will give you that power and you won't have the time to think about what they've just done. It's also an enormous responsibility. Now, things are gonna change a lot in the next few years in medicine. And I'll talk a little bit about the changes. Um, one of them is I think that fee-for-service medicine is gonna disappear. In our system of medicine, you keep paying, uh, we, now you're gonna be on this, we keep getting paid for doing things whether they're necessary or not. The way institutions and physicians make money in our system is we do stuff. And the way the system works, which is a crazy system, is we get paid to do as much stuff as we possibly can, and that's how we get paid. Now, I'm gonna say that 80, 95% of physicians are honest, just like any other profession, but I can tell you that I, I know what this seduction looks like. As a, a general practitioner, somebody comes in, and I really am struggling to figure out what's going on, the default position is, well, let's try another MRI. Well, wait a minute, I had an MRI last month. I know, but I'm not sure. You know, and the insurance company pays for it anyway, so why not do it? The default position is to do something else and to do an additional test. As long as, that, is, that means we don't make money in this business or this institution unless people are sick. If you get rid of fee-for-service medicine and pay on a per capita basis, we make money by keeping people healthy. Instead of we making a lot of money for ourselves or the hospital by putting people in to the MRI or having another cardiac catheterization or doing a big procedure, we make more money if we keep them as far away from the ICU as possible and do the preventive care that it takes when they're 25 years old and have diabetes from getting dialysis when they're 50 years old. We need to change that system. It's going to happen. I'm not going to go into the details of the Affordable Care Act or Trump Care or any of that stuff, but the truth is that the private sector is still lively enough, it's still a major payer in this country, and it's gonna force these changes because we can't keep growing it at, at the three times, two, three times the rate of inflation. So you're gonna see that change. What does it mean? For those of you in primary care, it's gonna be great because you're gonna get a raise. For those of you with the high-end specialties, watch out because you're the ones the hospital comes to when they wanna make a lot of money, and it's not your fault. It's the system's fault, it's the way it works. We reward illness in our system, we don't reward wellness, we need a system that rewards wellness. I think that's gonna happen because I think capitalism works and efficiency in capitalism is gonna drive us towards that model. But that's something to think about. The next thing that's gonna happen, for, now this has pretty much already happened for people your age, the last of it is in my generation, you're not gonna have any independent practices anymore unless they have 250 doctors in them. You're not gonna have a practice like I did with four doctors. Um, and it, and a, it's a low expense, low, uh, low overhead um, and low reimbursement uh, practice. That's not going to happen. Because the complexities of medicine with the insurance problems and the permissions you have to get and the malpractice and all these other things, somebody else is going to have to handle that. And it's usually going to be the hospitals or the institutions that you work for, which are mostly going to be some form of hospitals. That doesn't mean that you're going to work in a hospital. Because when we switch over to a a system where you're rewarded for keeping people well and out of the hospital, what's actually is going to happen is hospitals are going to invest in nursing homes, they're going to invest in hospice. Let me give you another thought about cost controls. People always ask, well, we spend, you know, whatever the percentage is, some say 40, 30, 50, whatever the number is, a percent of a person's entire healthcare expenditure are spent in the last six months of their lives. There are lots of different statistics, but it's an, everybody agrees it's an enormous amount of money is spent in the last six months of our patients' lives. There is a simple, easy fix for this, and it is very hard for us as doctors to think about. The simple, easy fix is simply to return the control of the dying process back to the patient and their family. We are the most competitive people on earth Think how hard it was for you to get into this medical school, or any medical school. They turned down 10 or 15 people just as good as you are to take you, or almost as good as you are. <laughs> but it's almost impossible. I mean, there's a certain amount of luck of the draw. Think how hard it is to get in. We are very competitive people. Think how hard you had to work to get in here. We are very competitive. And we are more competitive than most any other people in any other field, because it's so hard to get in here and it's so hard to keep up, and it's so hard to get any sleep when we're working and working and working as you will be in your house officership in the next few years. 
The problem is the opponent that we have in this contest is not another human being. The opponent, as we see it, is death. And so we fight and we fight and we fight and we never give up and we never let the patient die. And we have forgotten that dying is the last act of life. And that control has to be given back to the patient and their family. I have always believed that the one thing that my elderly patients feared much more than dying was being kept alive by my ordering tubes in every orifice and machines to keep them artificially alive. Patients and their families know when the time has come. You're there to help guide them, to help them make that decision in the best way that they can. That's going to save us a lot of money. It's going to save them a lot of pain and anguish. And it's not easy. It's one of the things that I think has happened that's good in Medicare recently is they allow two visits a day uh, in the ICU, not just the pulmonologist or an anesthesiologist who's running the ICU as they should, but also the primary care person. Why? Because the family's known that primary care person for a long time. They can help them through the dying process if that's not gonna happen. The hospice movement is something else that I think is incredibly important. We do not want people to die in the ICU with tubes coming out of every place and not being able to communicate with their families. If you want to see death with dignity, go to a well-run hospice organization. We have to think about these things as we change medicine and as you change medicine. And you have an obligation to change. It is not enough simply to practice medicine. You have to change your community. You have to change your country. You have to change the way medicine is practiced. Not one person has to do all of this. You have to do it collectively. Your generation has done more to change America than mine did, and mine did a lot. Civil rights, human rights, uh, the, the struggle against the Vietnam War. We dramatically changed the nation. You're doing it at a much, gener a much younger age. It's extraordinary. One of the problems we have is you guys aren't interested in politics. Why aren't you interested in politics? Why would you sit in Congress for 30 years and blab if you can go out and change foreign aid by starting your own foreign aid project, which young people have done? Why, or, or make money by selling a pair of shoes in the United States, and for every pair of shoes you sell to an American, somebody in Africa gets them, a kid in Africa gets them for free. These things have been done by people who your age. Why would you bother with politics? Because you don't like institutions. That has to change, and it's my job, and our job, and our generation, I think, at this time, to step out of active political persuasion, get you guys involved on your own terms, the way, rebuild the institutions the way you want them to be built, and we'll coach you to do that. I think one of the things you're institution, you're, you don't understand quite, or that you may after the recent election, is that politics is a substitute for war. And I think it's a mean business, it's a tough business, it's a much better business. We just had a revolution in this country. It, it, the French Revolution had something similar, and several hundred thousand people were sent to their deaths at the guillotines. To my knowledge, nobody got that treatment, at least not yet. So, so you have to understand what the stakes are. Asset allocation and succession is what politics is about. It's about what war is about. So over the last 400 years, we have evolved a system where we can have massive changes in society without killing huge numbers of people. You need to participate in those changes in society. Not everybody has to do what I did or go into politics or whatever, but you owe your community something. You can't just practice medicine. You can't, quote unquote, just be an MD. You have to be part of your community. And the price of not being part of your community is the loss of your democracy. You will lose democracy. Look at Poland and Hungary, they're losing their democracy. They're going to get it back because there's still a very active set of institutions and people who are working hard to maintain their democracy. You have to be involved in your community. Whether you run for the school board, whether you take time off to volunteer in a Big Sisters or a Big Brothers program, whatever it is, it's not that you owe your community something, although you do. What you owe is yourself, is to yourself and to your family, that you have to put something in the pot to keep the community going. And the last thing I'm going to say is probably the most important. It will be unbelievably easy for you, because you're going to be among the hardest working people in the United States of America. It will be unbelievably easy to you to rationalize staying a lot of extra hours in the hospital or in the office. 
There will be enormous pressure. There will always be another patient. If you marry and you have children or you have families or even if you don't have children but you have other people that you're responsible to, at that time, at the end of your life, when it's your time to reflect back long after perhaps you've left practice, you are never going to wish that you'd stayed in the operating room to do one more C-section or stayed in the pediatrics office to see three more patients. You are never going to wish that. What you are going to wish is that you hadn't skipped your child's soccer game and that you hadn't missed your brother's graduation and that you hadn't not gone to the PTAO meeting for the 69th time in a row. There is nothing more important than your family. What you're about to do is the noblest profession on the face of the earth, I believe, if you do it right. Also, you're going to have more power in individuals' lives than anybody else except parents. You are a parent first, if that's what you choose to become, or other, to other people that you love, if you choose not to have children. Do not forget that responsibility. That is something you cannot fix after you pass it over. So when you're exhausted and when you want to do that one more case or when the thrill of the hunt, this is a big problem for politicians, when the th thrill of the hunt just keeps you on the, on the dais one more time or it happens in finance where you just want to do one more deal, you are never going to regret that you didn't do that, more deal, that one more deal at the end. But you will regret deeply the sacrifices you made for the people you loved where you should have been if you make that wrong decision. Thanks very much. Thank you, Adam. And now, our student speaker, Vinod Meshery. There's no hiding from here on out, no escape lines of, I'm just a medical student. The patient will no longer be standardized. Screaming jello will not end the patient encounter. <laughs> Reflecting on the arc of medical school over the past few weeks has been filled with moments that end with, oh yeah, hmm. Those first two months, being introduced to sleep deprivation, getting our EMT license, with that uniform a reminder, in college, there's a freshman 15, in med school, the MS-150. <laughs> Getting that short, pristine white coat, which is now a culture for countless diseases. I remember the last toast at our first social gathering, way back when, was to the good, the bad, and the pearls, whatever that is. <laughs> Thus would begin the two-year conquest to battle out every Monday to read cases and decide what to study. Initially, of course, you couldn't help but sit back and wonder, why are we doing this? <laughs> Does it really matter if we say describe or justify? <laughs> At some point, you realize that getting the right answers is actually pretty easy when information is readily available. The hard part is asking the right question. Triggers became a bi-weekly, mentally torturous pursuit of the higher order. You would hold on to that intellectual property you spent hours crafting and only reveal it at the last possible moment. <laughs> the point, of course, was to show you don't actually understand something unless you can teach it to someone else. And the wrap-ups. Sitting, forced to go around, sharing your faults and improvements. <laughs> Learning to self-reflect, set a marker, and advance. I mean, there it is. The culture we were ingrained in, that will be the prevailing force going forward. The bet has been set and made that the trinity of questioning teaching and reflecting will be what differentiates us. 
I no longer remember Dr. Elkowitz scanning the room, reading our journal signature to answer his question, and you just repeating that mantra, don't break eye contact. <laughs> The most difficult part of your week back then was, after four hours of school, having to go watch someone else work for three hours. Then rotations, suddenly thrusted from the center of attention to this peripheral role where you have to prove your worth because the patient comes first. That 8 a.m. start you took for granted suddenly became a godsend. <laughs> having to stay an extra hour until 1 p.m. for reflection became incredibly enticing. <laughs> that first glimpse of what practicing medicine is actually like and all the while having to figure out, wait, what am I actually going to do with my life? It was much an exercise in figuring out who you were as it was in what you wanted to become. But we answered it. And it seems that everything led to that day we all shared just a few weeks back, where our fates were sealed in this envelope. We ripped it open, excitement, disbelief, and then a calmness that's finally an answer to what comes next came into focus. We all took different paths to get to this point. And when you're surrounded by people who are doctors or people who are going to become physicians, we forget that none of this is guaranteed. Less than 10% of people who applied our year got a spot, which means you worked hard in med school. You worked really hard to get in here. But it's important that hard work gets recognized. And that's with opportunity. I know for me personally, getting acceptance here was my last shot at a career in medicine. December 6, 2012, I had decided to take a day off work. 4 p.m. I got this email. Important update from the Hofstra North Shore LIJ School of Medicine. Clicked on it, and there it was. Delighted to offer you a position. I immediately called home, told my parents, and I thought to myself, I really have to take more days off work. <laughs> I had applied to several places, and you get numb to the rejection after a while. But it was here where the decision was made, hey, you know what, this kid's got something. I think they can do it. I see the body of work they've created, and they deserve the chance to become a physician. Before we could be here, we had to be invited, accepted, and provided with that opportunity by those that sit behind me. Whatever we are now, a few years back, we just wanted a shot, and it was here where we got it. Talking to my mother later that night after I got the acceptance, she laughed telling me, it's funny how things come full circle. A little over 20 years ago, I was living in England, where my parents were completing their then second residency after having left India. They decided to come to the States. My mother applied, flew all over the country, interviewed much like we did just a few months back, until one day she sat before a man named Dr. Harvey Ages. He reviewed her application and offered her a residency position on the spot. Dr. Ages was vice chairman of pediatrics at Schneider Hospital, which we now is Cone's Children's, and at North Shore. My father received a position shortly after at Neurochelle in internal medicine, and that was it. I would be trading my incredibly suave British accent for this. <laughs> a few years later, as my mother was finishing residency at North Shore, my sister was born there. So as I stand here in the same place they stood so long ago, about to embark on a journey they did, I asked them repeatedly, how did you do it and why? And why go through residency in three different countries, leave everything you know behind, that security to go be a stranger in a strange land. The response, why not? We had everything in front of us. We're given an opportunity, so why not? At some point, someone in each of our families took that gamble on us so that we could stand here today. My parents have repeatedly told me when I'm in their position, I won't ask why or how. That almost seems ridiculous. Of course we did this, and you will too. Because when you're a parent, all you want is a better life for your child, plain and simple. People are going to continuously come and go from our lives, but our parents, our family, will be the rock that remains. Our success is their success, and as we continue forward, because of them, what we represent is something far greater than ourselves. Now, dwelling on the past is important, but it's also easier than ever before. Anyone who knows me knows I like to take a lot of photos. <laughs> In my head, when you capture a moment, you create a window back to re-experience that time. To everyone else, I'm cataloging blackmail available to the highest bidder. <laughs> we'll see who's right. <laughs> That's the only way connecting the dots makes sense, is by looking back. But now as we look forward, that uncomfortable uncertainty of the unknown is there. It feels different this time. You know, when you Wikipedia someone, an entire life gets siloed into these categories. There's career, personal life, legacy. The first is always early life and education. And that's what it is. 
For the grand majority of us, we've only known school. This controlled educational environment where you work hard, steady, get assessed, and continue. And to be here means you excelled at that, but that's all we've known, it's just increasing intensities of academics. So it's not just medical school that's ending. That entire phase of our lives is coming to a close. So what's next, the finally adulthood? I was once told you needed two things to be an adult. You need to own a bed with a headboard, and you need to pay for your cell phone bill. <laughs> One represents lifestyle, the other fiscal responsibility. I was 0 for 2. That was five years ago. Nothing's changed. <laughs> Last summer, I was at my five-year reunion for college. Nothing really changed for the people in my class. We were working or in school. Everyone looked a little bit older. The 10-year reunion was there. For the most part, everyone was married and had a baby stroller. Yeah, a lot happens in the next five years. We'll all be in different places have different people in our lives, but what will remain is that common bond that we got our MD from Hofstra Northwell. Most institutions that you've been a part of in your life, what they represent was established by the time you got there. You inherited something. This place is very much a work in progress. The book is still being written. Ask people how often they got to, how often they got to be part of something new, undefined in their life, and I think you find it's pretty rare. So what does an MD from Hofstra Northwell mean? We don't have a 100-year legacy behind us. It's all to be created. Everything we do going forward in medicine will come back right here. And I very much look forward to that time, 5, 10, 20 years from now, to see what we build. Now, after reflecting on the past and talking about the future, we should not avoid the gravity of the moment at hand. These relationships you've built over the last four years, the ones that took you from Mr. or Miss to Doctor, it may be quite a while until you see these people again. The truth is, you've been here before, when you left high school, when you left college, and you will be here again. We had our laughs and our tears, our frustrations, our triumph. It all translates to the same thing, this growth. Whatever we are today is the sum of all those interactions. Previous times, when I've been at this point in my life, I've always given a half-hearted, keep in touch, or I'll see you when I see you. It was just a measure to avoid confronting the fact that a chapter had closed. But I see now, not only is it okay to acknowledge the last page's turn, it's right to do it. It's dawning on me now that what I've experienced in life has really been a never-ending act of letting go. But I'm realizing how what I've regretted was not taking the time to say thank you and goodbye. Thank you to show recognition that all of this has left an indelible impact. And goodbye to show that this was not just some means or some stepping stone. But that transformation we all took together was an end in itself. So with that, first to our parents and family, who raised us, loved us, take us for what we are, and show us we can be more. Thank you. To the faculty and administration, who provided us with an opportunity, took us in as their own, and had the strength of conviction to execute on a vision, those they privileged with the title of MD will be better than those before. Thank you. And finally, to the strangers who became my classmates, and then my friends, and are now family. Thank you for what has been the greatest privilege of my life. Good luck. Goodbye. Graduates, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the trustees of Hofstra University and by the regents of the state of New York, 
and upon the recommendation of the Provost, Dean Smith, and the wonderful faculty of the medical school, I am delighted to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Philosophy. Congratulations. We ask that first Joseph Carrion come to the stage to be hooded by and receive his degree from Dr. Betty Diamond, Program Director of the PhD and MD PhD programs. come to the stage to be hooded by Dr. Ann Davidson, the investigator under whom you worked and received your diploma from Dr. Betty Diamond. Accepting my Doctor of Philosophy degree, I earnestly assert I will apply my scientific skills and principles to benefit society. I will continue to practice and support a scientific process that is based on logic, intellectual rigor, personal integrity, and an uncompromising respect for truth. That means facts. <laughs> I will continue to practice and support a scientific process that is based on logic, intellectual rigor, personal integrity, and uncompromising respect for truth. I will treat my colleagues' work with respect and objectivity and be a collaborator within the scientific community, sharing knowledge and resources resulting from my research. I will treat my colleagues' work with respect and objectivity and be a collaborator within the scientific community, sharing knowledge and resources resulting from my research. I will teach these scientific principles to my students. I will seek to increase public understanding of the principles of science and its humanitarian goals. These things I do promise. Graduates, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the trustees and by the regents of the state of New York and upon the recommendation of Dean Smith and the faculty of the School of Medicine, I am delighted and privileged to confer upon you your degree, 
Doctor of Medicine. Congratulations. <laughs> We ask that each of the graduates come to the stage to be introduced by Dr. Ellen Perlman, Associate Dean for the Advanced Clinical Experience, footed by Dr. Samara Ginsberg, Associate Dean for Case-Based Learning and Co-Director of the Office of Academic Success, receive their diploma from Dr. David Batnelli, Dean for Medical Education, and be recognized by President Stuart Rabinowitz and Michael Daly. You may notice that some, some students will be hooded by someone other than Dr. Ginsburg, and that would be because they have family members who are physicians. But first, we take pride as a school to start with graduate Jocelyn Eve Greenshire. Yes! Our, school, our school's military student will be given her diploma and take her oath of office, which signifies her promotion to the, in the U.S. Navy Medical Corps. Jocelyn will be led in her oath by Colonel Nelson Rosen. Dr. Rosen is a pediatric surgeon at Northwell Health System who has served in the Army for 23 years is, and is currently in command of one of the 15 U.S. Army Medical Brigades, the Mighty 338, in Horsham, Pennsylvania. After recitation of her oath, which you can find printed in the back of your programs, Jocelyn's husband, Jonathan Lee, will uncover the new stripe on Jocelyn's sleeve, showing her new rank of Lieutenant Dr. Rosen. And, and Jonathan, please join us, as well as Dr. Rosen. Where is he? There he is.
Kevin Celtic with Distinction in Research.
Dr. Josh Joshua Heisler.
after Mary's son.
Straver being hooded by his father, Dr. James Straver.
Or let's have a round of applause for the whole class. kissing takes a lot of time. <laughs> so, you know, when we have only 72 students uh, from the MD and two from the PhD, but all this other stuff, we have to allow a lot more time for graduation. But that's what's special about our medical school. <laughs> so, we're not moving right to the oath. We will we'll get to the oath. But you know that uh, I rarely leave an opportunity uh, to address the class. And uh, I like to tell stories. And I thought about, what should I tell you about? And decided that I would tell you about this past Saturday. So this past Saturday was the first time ever that we had brought together the people I went to high school with. It was 50 years. And none of us, except for the occasional one or two, had seen each other. And one person telling me that the internet can find any human being that is not locked in a cave, found almost everyone who graduated with us. And we had well over two thirds of the class show up from all over the country. And part of the exercise was to tell everyone what had transpired in your life in the last 50 years. And so I listened to 34 stories of 50 years of life. And once I got past how the hell did 50 years pass? And do I look that old? Uh, I was listening. And what did I hear? I heard people talk about being lawyers and teachers and all the different professions. But threaded into every person's story were the special moments where they gave back. So one teacher had taught in a high school in Binghamton, New York. And then after his 20 years said, it was time to give back. And he spent the last 20 years teaching in a prison in upstate New York. And one of the people retired early and decided that he would build a program of sustainable housing in Guatemala. And he's been doing that ever since. And the stories went on and on. And what they talked about was not what made them their money but what gave them the human connection, what gave them the feeling that they could give back and have meaning in their life. And it was a very, very interesting, very impressive, and very special time as we all came together in Rockville Center and, and told the story of what had just happened in the last 50 years, which is a long time. And so I've thought a lot about why each person selected out those very pieces of their life to tell us about. And it's clear. It's clear that the best privilege you will ever have is to have a life with meaning. And that is what doctoring was designed to do. So you need to remember that it is a privilege to have a life with meaning. Many, many people live their whole lives without that opportunity. It's a privilege to be able to give back, to take care of others. And it's really amazing that some would be will someone would be willing to pay you to do what is just so wonderful that almost everybody in my class who did those things did them for nothing. So I'll tell you one other story that, that struck me as so amazing, I, I have to share it with you. So one of my classmates, unbeknownst to anyone in our class, was a foster child during high school. Both of his parents had died, and he was in foster care, going from, house, from family to family during his grammar school years. And the family he landed in in high school kept him. They kept him as a foster child, but all through high school, and all through college, and have remained his foster parents for life. And after a few years out of college, he decided that that was the only reason he was who he was, was that these people, out of the blue, had decided to keep him as their own child. And so, unmarried, he has adopted 17 children. And he has 53 grandchildren. 
and that stopped the conversation in the room when he told us that. <laughs> Not because we can't imagine how you feed 17 children, he did it over a lot of years, but how, how powerful things touch our life and how forcibly some people have a desire to pay back. And I think we all hugged him and we all thought this is really special to be in a group of people that have worked so hard to pay back. And so I want to read you one of my favorite poems, and if you were here last year, you heard it, but too bad. Uh, <laughs> and it's by William Stafford. And William Stafford was a great American poet who had a habit of writing all his poetry when he first woke up in the morning, before he did anything else. And as he became ill and knew he was going to die, he was more intensely writing poetry. And in fact, he wrote a poem on the morning of the day he actually died. But I'm going to read you a poem that he wrote 26 days before he passed away. It was one of the thousand poems he's written. And it's called The Way It Is. And I think it addresses something important for all of us. Because we all have stressors in our life. We all get tired. We all get cynical. But we all came to medicine to do good. And if we forget that for even a minute, we'll lose our way. So let me read you this poem, The Way It Is. There's a thread you follow. It goes among, th among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding, but you don't ever let go of the thread. I wish that you never let go of the thread and that you have a wonderful life caring for others. And now, you and all the physicians in the audience, I ask to rise and join me in the oath. Please turn to the, your program so that you can read it together with me. We're going to read it together. Don't repeat after me. We're going to read it together. It starts, I swear. Everybody's ready. Okay. I swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment this covenant. I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk and gladly share such knowledge as is mine with those who are followed. I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy, and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. I will not be ashamed to say I know not, nor will I fail to call in my colleagues when the skills of another are needed for a patient's recovery. I will respect the privacy of my patients for their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. Most especially must I tread with care in matters of life and death, and never abuse the power that has been bestowed upon me. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being, whose illness may affect not only the person, but a family and the community. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. I will remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, those sound of mind and body, as well as the infirm. I will maintain the health of my own body, body and spirit, so I am able to discharge my duties appropriately. If I do not violate this oath, may I enjoy life and art, respected while I live, and remembered with affection thereafter. May I always act so as to preserve the finest traditions of my calling, and may I long experience the joy of healing to seek my help. Thank you. And now, I ask you, the class of 2017, to turn around and applaud all the people who have helped you to be here.
Okay, everyone can take their seat. I invite everyone here to please return to the medical school, either by walking or by shuttle bus, to join us in the celebration. Please stay in your seats until the platform party processes out, and then we will all leave the auditorium. And thank you very much, and congratulations. Yeah.